Today, I am going to hopefully help you demystify sourdough. Uh, my name is Mackenzie, and you are watching Little Farm Folk. So, for the Make Bread 365 challenge that we have going on for the month of May, it is a artisan loaf. I will have recipes up on my website to go to to try, as well as free downloads on my website as well. Does that make sense? <laughs> Jessica. I will have recipes on the blog and I will also have the monthly PDF download on my online shop. I hope that helps. Okay, hope that makes sense. Um, and so for this month, I really want you guys to learn how to do sourdough. Um, it's not that hard once you figure it out. And it's something that I did struggle with for many years. It wasn't until this past year that my friend Brittany, um, who is a foodie, former food blogger extraordinaire, you know, all the things, she invited me and my other friend Claire over to her house and taught us how to do sourdough. So thank you very much, Brittany, for teaching me. It finally makes sense, and I'm really excited to be able to share her method with you. Um, so if you get a chance, I'm going to link Brittany's blog, uh, Brittany's website down here. She's a photographer. So if you're looking for someone locally to do family sessions or things like that, please consider supporting her by booking a session with her or stopping by her Instagram and just leaving a nice comment on some of her photos because that helps boost her algorithm. Brittany took a method from Shay Elliott, which is the dry starter, and then she also kind of combined it with the recipe for the tartine bread and kind of came up with her own recipes there. So that's what I'm going to share with you today. Before we jump too far into that method, I just want to talk a little bit about sourdough for people who have maybe never heard of it before um, or you've just been really confused. So sourdough basically is a process of fermentation. What happens is you mix flour and water together and the natural yeasts and the environment and the air off your hands will feed off of the sugars in the flour and it will cause a byproduct, which is like a carbon dioxide gas and there's a few other gases. And the release of those gases will cause these beautiful, gorgeous air bubbles and it causes the bread to rise. So um, that is basically what it is. It's a natural leveling, leavening agent. Um, they've, you, people have used sourdough for many, many years, and this was just what you did. You always had a starter, and um, that's how you made your bread. Now, going into the early 1800s, there was a guy who realized that he could now manufacture, manufacture or like granulize yeast and that was kind of the beginning of commercial yeast and then over the years it's been processed more and even into the 1970s it came up with a rapid rise yeast um, and so there are many benefits to sourdough which is like it like would pre-digest the flour a little bit better so it's easier on the gut um, but I also really enjoy using commercial yeast too. I don't think there's one that's better than the other. It's just what works in my household with what I have to get done kind of thing. With most sourdough starters, what you'll see is you will have your starter. Um, you can buy them or make a starter. I do have some other links to other YouTube videos for people who make their own starters. Personally, I don't enjoy making my own starter. I think it's just one more thing to babysit and probably mess up. Um, so like I got this starter from Brittany. You can buy starters that are dehydrated and then rehydrate them. They're a lot faster. Just bum a fresh one off of a friend. Um, you can take any sourdough starter and turn it into a dry starter. With most sourdoughs, starters you usually feed them a one-to-one -one ratio of like 100, 100 grams of water 100 grams of flour. A dry starter is only a little bit different because you just feed it a little bit more flour than you do water. The benefits to this is that when you are constantly having a sourdough starter on the counter like a regular one-to-one -one ratio you have to continually feed it once a day once a week depending on the temperature of your home you have to manage the discard and i always found that it, it ended up being like a ton of waste of flour i hated having to mix it every night i would constantly kill it it would get what's called hooch on it which is like that yeah that gray 
um, water on top of it, which is basically an alcohol. It's like a byproduct of like starving yeast in there. And I just, I don't have time to babysit stuff like that. And so when Brittany told me that she does the dry starter method, I was like, I really want to hear this because it sounds a little bit more manageable than what I'm typically used to seeing. Um, with this starter, you actually only feed it 50 grams of water and 100 grams of flour, and I'll post the recipe too on a blog post for you as well, so you can go there. Um, and so it's just, I don't know, it's just a lot more manageable. I can keep this guy in my refrigerator for a few weeks. It will die back. All those bubbles will go away. I pull it out the night before. I will feed it and wait what's called a Levine, which is this right here it's basically just the sourdough starter fed back to a one-to-one -one ratio and i will do it the night before and then the next thing you know i can make sourdough the next day i don't have to feed this multiple times i don't have to manage it i don't have to worry about the discards i have even left this sucker on my counter for a few weeks and i thought for sure it's probably done for and I fed it one time and it bounced right back. I think the biggest difference is it has less water in it and more flour so it takes longer to ferment. I don't know. I've also noticed that I get way way better sourdough fermentation bubbles with this than a regular starter. So this has just been it's been really lovely. So I took my starter out last night from my refrigerator. It sat in there a few nights and I'll go ahead and I'll show you a video of what it looked like last night I went ahead and fed it and I'm going to put together another video for how to feed and maintain your starter and then um, I went ahead and I made my Levine so Levine is a French word you can say leaven Levine I basically took a little bit off of my starter put it in here I think it was 60 grams of starter, and then I did 100 grams of water and 100 grams of flour to make my bread today. This sourdough starter, I'm gonna show you how to refeed it again, but after I feed it again, it's just gonna go back into my kitchen. The biggest thing that didn't make sense to me was when you first had a starter, you have to make sure that you're always holding back some starter to continue to refeed it. You can't just, use it all once and then you're and then you're done kind of thing so you have to just hold back a little bit just a tablespoon or two so for this video right now because i have a billion things to do uh, like plant a bunch of strawberries that's kind of on the priority list um i'm gonna go ahead and show you guys how to make the bread recipe this particular artisan loaf recipe it will take two to three days to bake you'll do your first night which is where you will feed your leaven the next day you will mix your dough. You will do a set of stretch and fold, four of them every 30 minutes for two hours. And I'll show you that. And then you will let it basically bulk rise for three to eight hours. And then after that, you will wrap it. You can put it in the refrigerator and let it ferment overnight and then score it in the morning. Or you can take it out, you can score it today, and you can bake it. And so that's why I say it's a two to three day process. It probably sounds like a lot if you've never done this before, but just hang in there. I'm telling you, it's very easy, and I just, I want you to be able to do this. So <clears throat> what I'm going to do is I'm going to need a kitchen scale. When you cook with sourdough, most recipes will be in grams. The reason for that is because you can get more consistent results when you're actually measuring by grams. In America, we use the English Standard Version of measuring and we use cups and that's really measuring the volume, it's not measuring the weight. And when you measure volume and you eyeball it, it's going to be different every time. Your scoop may be more compacted than my scoop or my scoop may bulge over more whereas yours is flat. So when you're doing it with sourdough, you want consistent results. That's why having a scale is nice. And honestly, the more that you learn how to cook from scratch, if you learn to make butter or anything like that and you wanna weigh out your, your ingredients, it's worth having a scale. I think this was maybe $11, might be up to 20 bucks now, who knows. But it's definitely worth having. Um, and then also we're gonna be measuring in 
don't know if you can see it's so dirty here. Grams, we're gonna be measuring in grams. The flour that I'm using is King Arthur bread flour. You don't have to use organic, but I do recommend for this recipe and just learning how to do sourdough all together, buy the King Arthur bread flour. The reason is it's a high protein flour. I think it has 12%. And that protein has to do with the gluten development and, and the rise. And so it really will make a big difference to have that bread flour. I know it's like $6 for a bag, but I think you can get several loaves out of it and it's still gonna be cheaper than store-bought bread. So when you're first getting started, buy the King Arthur bread flour. I think you can get it at any grocery store it will really help you out in the long run to have consistent results and to finally figure it out. Okay, so um, like I said, I have my Levine from yesterday and I have my flour. The next thing that you're gonna need for this recipe is some salt. You can use any type of salt that you want. I like, uh, what is it, Redmond's Real Salt. Um, it does have a little bit more of a mineral taste to it. It has, it's a little bit grittier. Some people don't like that. You can use sea salt. Don't use kosher salt, but you could even use regular table salt if you wanted to. Um, that doesn't matter. The next thing you're gonna need is water and then some type of bowl or vessel to mix your recipe in. So for my container, I'm gonna mix it in is just one of these plastic, I don't know, restaurant style containers with a lid it's called Cambrio maybe. I got these at the restaurant store locally. They're like five bucks. This recipe is gonna make two loaves of bread and this just perfectly fits the, the recipe. Um, so I really love it. I also like it because it has the sides. So when I start to do my stretch and folds, I'm gonna go in, pull up, fold over, rotate, go in, pull up, pull over rotate and so it's actually kind of nice because you have the four sides and you can kind of see it's like oh yeah it was on this side kind of thing but a bowl will work just fine you don't need fancy tools for this um sourdough is very easy the only thing that you will need <clears throat> later on for this recipe is a dutch oven to bake it in for um for the make bread giveaway this month is sponsored by victoria and they are giving away a cast iron dutch oven so be sure to check back to my instagram all right so i'm gonna go ahead I might need to move this over just a little bit so you can see. I uh, am missing my tripod. I have no idea where it is. So, where is that? All the way back over here. I'm missing my tripod. And so I have you sitting on top of a blender right now. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead, put my bucket on my scale. Turn this around so you can see it here. Ignore how messy everything is. I would clean it, but I don't have time. Okay, I had it on grams already. Here's my grams. I'm gonna tear it out. Okay, and now it's set to zero. The first thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to add my Levine. This should be anywhere from like 225 grams to 235 grams in here. Just dump the whole thing in, it'll be fine. The problem with making YouTube videos is you realize how filthy everything is and then you feel like you need to incessantly wash it all before you use it. But again, who has time? Look. Look at that. So right now I just want to take a moment to show you just the consistency. See how runny um, this is compared to my dry starter. My dry starter is a lot harder to mix, but the leaven is very smooth has a very nice silky consistency to it. Can you hear the TV in the background? That's my kids. You can see it's already super duper. It's bubbly, it's gorgeous. And I'm gonna go ahead and add 750 grams of water, of lukewarm water here. Now tear it out, make sure you tear it out every time so you don't have to do math. You want to use filtered water. You don't want to use chlorinated water because that would actually kill the bacteria here. So we're on a well, we have filtered water. You can run water through a Berkey if you have a, a Berkey, um, maybe buy water if you have like really chlorinated water, um, that kind of thing, but filtered water, okay? 750 grams.
If you accidentally pour too much water in, don't panic. Just get a measuring cup and scoop it right out. It's okay if you accidentally scoop up a little bit of starter. All is not lost. Okay, that's 751. Sometimes you'll see the sourdough starter floating. That means it's ready to bake too, but it doesn't necessarily mean it. It's completely true, so just don't think all is lost if it doesn't float. Yeah, see mine's floating now. I pulled it off the thing and oh, it's floating. Don't overthink it. Just make the bread, right? Just do it. Make the bread, just like, what is it, Danielle from Jones Root says, make bad bread all the time. It's a good saying. Just, even if it sucks the first time, just redo it and try again. I'm gonna figure it out, I promise. Okay, so what I'm just doing is mixing in my starter with the water, just because it mixes a lot easier. And that's it. I've never owned like one of those fancy dough hooks or anything like that. I'm just, Use this. Although I should say this is a, a fancy spatula. It's a lid croissant. My husband got it for me for a Christmas once. It's like ridiculously overpriced set that they all broke. <laughs> Except for two, I should say. So. Okay, now I'm gonna go ahead and add my flour. Again, bread flour, use bread flour. Don't mess it up. I have had really good success with using a fresh milled flour, like a fresh milled hard white wheat. With this recipe, instead of doing a thousand grams of bread flour, I just do 50 grams of bread flour and a thousand and 500 uh, grams of fresh milled hard white wheat, and that gives a really nice, delicious tasting loaf too. Um, when it comes to sourdough and fresh milled grains, the problem is the bran in there will act almost like shards of glass. And I learned this from, um, uh, what's her name? Turner Farms. I can't remember her name, but Turner Farms. Um, she wrote a really good article in the Homegrown uh, magazine. And basically, she described it that the bran is basically like shards of glass popping the air bubbles in there. And so that's why it's so much harder to do fresh milled and sourdough to get that nice rise. It's not impossible, but there's just a little bit more things that you have to do along the way. And so I found doing the 50 50 blend is really nice because I still get the benefits of the sourdough and the fresh milled kind of married together with still the same crunch and rise and elasticity. And I'm fine with that. So. Now, if you have other dietary problems, and then you might want to dive in deeper and figure it out a little bit more. Okay, so a thousand grams here. So right now I'm at 1016. Because I did the water first, I can actually just take a handful right off the top, dump it back in. Seven, one, okay, that's perfect. My friend Rachel at Flower Valley Farm also followed this recipe recently. I think with an einkorn, I think she did bread flour einkorn mixture and she said it turned out really good too. So that's what it's about. Um, the next thing I'm gonna do is add 25 grams of my salt. You could use pink Himalayan salt. It really doesn't matter, whatever your preference is. Okay, so now I have it all mixed together. I have my starter, I have my water, I have my bread flour and my salt. That's all you need for this recipe. It's that easy. Um, I don't need my scale anymore for this part. I'm gonna go ahead and mix this up. Come apart point where you're just gonna have to use your hand to get the rest in. 
and I've actually found that when you use your hands, it makes the bread better. Um, I probably having to do with the natural yeast on your hands. Even when I feed my sourdough starter, I will use my hand to knead it, um, and it really just does so much better. So, sorry if you like clean hands. Sourdough is one of those things that you just kind of have to let go and touch the dough. So here I am, just kneading it. Trying to the hardest thing with the um, square containers is the corners. So make sure you get it all out of the corners. It's gonna be like this kind of shaggy Mod Podge dough. And like when Brittany taught me it, she's like, you kind of look at it and be like, there's no way this is gonna be bread, but it does. It does. It turns out to be bread. So hang in there, mix it up. So I can get a better shot here. Once the dough has been mixed, you're going to set a warm, wet cloth over it and let it sit for 30 minutes. And then from there, we will start our series of stretch and folds. Okay, so it's been 30 minutes while it's been resting. I'm gonna go ahead and start my first round of stretch and folds. Um, and I'm gonna get my hand wet too because it doesn't stick quite as much when you get your hand wet. So I've got two batches of dough started. This is gonna make four loaves total. It goes really quick, making a lot of bread. Here is what the dough looks like the first time around. And as we stretch and fold it, the gluten is going to get activated. Activated, I don't know what the word is. Activated something kind of like that. And it's gonna get stretchier basically. So what I'm gonna do is get my hand wet, I'm gonna put my hand in, pull the dough up to a point that it looks like it's gonna break, and then fold it over. Flip it, pull, fold over. Okay, I can do it like right up here. I'm gonna scrape as much as I can. I'm gonna pull up, fold over. Okay, ready? I'm gonna pull up and fold over. Flip it, grab my dough. Pull up, fold over. Pull up, and fold over. Just like that. Again, it doesn't look like much, but it will be something here soon. Here's my next one. Ready? Pull up, fold over. Pull up. Number two for a stretch and fold. All right, starting to look a little bit more gelatinous, more cohesive. Here we go. On our third set of stretch and folds. Okay. Mommy's gonna work on her bread right now, okay? Okay. almost impossible for me to do this with one hand, but. Okay, 
Okay. We are on our final set of stretch and folds. And let's get that done. Um, I have a class tonight that I'm going to. So I'm not going to get home until like probably super late, but I'll, I'll film the rest. Okay, so here we go. This is what it looks like. It's turning gorgeous and bubbly and smells amazing. So here we go. Take my corner. See how it's just like it's starting to stick together a lot more and even by the end of it your hands will become like less messy from mixing it. It doesn't like stick like near as much. And so like the stretching and the pulling is helping to develop the, the gluten strands. Can't talk. <laughs> I'm getting really tired. Helping to develop the gluten strands in the dough. And then tonight it's going to be all bubbly and I'm going to leave this in my kitchen for three to eight hours. So it's 3.45 p.m. right now. I have a class at 7 p.m. from 7 to 8.30. I probably won't get home until 9. And by then it should be, should be ready to go for the shaping. So here is basically the schedule. You would feed it the night before around 8 p.m. In the morning, you would mix the dough and let it sit for 30 minutes. At 8.30, stretch and fold. 9.30, stretch and fold. 10, stretch and fold. 10.30, stretch and fold. Let it sit from 10.30 on, three to eight hours, again, depending on the temperature of your house, and let it bulk rise. And then after the three to eight hours, we're going to take the dough out, we're going to separate it into two loaves, and then we are going to shape them. I'm going to wrap them and put them in the refrigerator and let them sit overnight. So I'll see you guys way later tonight. <laughs> oh, it is 9.30 at night and my bread is ready. It's probably overproofed a little bit, but this is as soon as I can get to it. So let's go ahead and shape it. Why it's probably overproofed, but that's okay. We're just gonna keep working with it. This is a bench scraper, it's great for cutting the loaves in half. As the dough is coming out of the container, I'm trying to be somewhat mindful of the air bubbles, but at the same time, mom ain't got time for that. So I just get it out of the bucket and then I'm using my bench scraper to try to equally split the loaves in half. And then from there, I'm going to kind of stretch them out um, to help shape the loaves. When it comes to shaping the dough, there's two different ways to do it. You can do like an envelope method where you would kind of pull it out flat, tri-fold it into three separate sections, one over the other, and then roll it up like a snail shell almost. Um, this one, I'm just laying it out flat and pulling all the pieces into the middle, and then I kind of just roll it into a ball. Um, you can use a lot of flour on this because it is a high hydration uh, recipe, so extra flour is not going to make it too dry. It's not going to hurt it if it's sticking to your hands. And then after that, I am taking my hands and using kind of a cupping method and kind of dragging it across the table. And as I drag it across the table, it's creating tension on the top layer and it's helping just to tighten and form that loaf so it'll have a really nice rise. Next, I'm going to heavily flour my banneton baskets. 
If you don't have one, that's fine. Just use a bowl with a tea towel. Don't use terry cloth though because the dough will stick to it. Um, make sure if you have bought new Benetton baskets, if you haven't seasoned them, you need to pre-season them, which is just getting them wet and putting flour in it and letting it dry. It might take a few bakes to keep all the flour from sticking to it. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to say too, which I don't remember. Okay. Next thing is I'm taking my loaf. I'm sticking it in upside down. Um, and then I'm what's called stitching the back of it, which is I'm taking the back sides and kind of pinching it together. And it just kind of tightens the back a little bit too. I'm just doing the same process over again for the second loaf and it's okay to use a lot of flour and if you saw me a minute ago I also floured the top of the loaf which is actually really the bottom of the loaf but I flour that again so that way nothing sticks because it's not fun in the morning time when you try and pull it up and your gorgeous loaf is sticking to that basket. <laughs> Last thing I'm going to do before I tuck them in the refrigerator overnight for a slow ferment is I'm going to wrap them in plastic wrap. Um, some people use shower caps for this. I don't because our house is really tiny and I have no extra room to keep anything extra. So I just throw it away and I don't feel guilty over it. It is the next day, which means it's baking day. I already have one loaf in and it's done and it's beautiful. They are absolutely delicious. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna show you how to bake your loaves. The first thing you wanna do is go ahead and warm up your oven. You want it to be 450 degrees and you wanna go ahead and put your Dutch oven in the oven as well so it's very, very, very hot. The next thing you'll need is some parchment paper and then a little scoring knife. You can buy these little blades off of Amazon in like 100 packs, I think. Um, and um, Or you can buy like a little sleeve, a little leather sleeve. You can get the actual handle that goes with it, but this works for me. These are very sharp, but they are very flexible. So you can see they're very, they're not like a regular razor blade. So what you wanna do is get some parchment paper, set it out. You'll also need a small glass of water or ice. We don't have an ice maker, so we typically don't have a lot of ice. So I just use a little glass of water. I'm gonna get my dough out. It's like totally rainy out today, so I'm definitely wearing my pajama bottoms. <laughs> it's just one of those days. It's really nice. Okay, so here's my loaf. I'm gonna take off the plastic. You can resave it or throw it away, whatever you wanna do. Honestly, I just toss it because our house is too tiny. I don't have any extra drawers to be saving any extra plastic in my life. So, all right, I'm gonna take it, I'm gonna flip it, flip it over onto, let's put this down a little bit lower. Okay. If you want to, you could get like a pizza plate and like stick it over and then flip it, but flop works just fine. Now hopefully mine doesn't stick. I had one. Okay. Every 
down and they'll stick a little bit. There we go. Perfect. I was worried it was going to stick there for a minute. Okay. The next thing I'm going to do is take my little knife and I'm going to score it. Um, this makes a break in the um, bread for the steam to escape and for it to expand and it's going to give it a place to expand where you want it to rather than like blowing out the side. So, let's see if I can do this. How does that look? Oh, that's pretty good there. You can do lots of fun decorations. I honestly just do one on the side. It's just... Don't overcomplicate it. People do some gorgeous swirls and decorations. And all these lovely things. But I'm pretty busy. So this is what I have. All right, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to get out my Dutch oven. Okay. Remember, your Dutch oven is very hot. Don't touch it barehanded, okay? Especially later on when you take the lid off. Um, so I have the oven at 450 degrees. It's going to bake in the oven with the lid on for 30 minutes, and then I'm going to bake it an additional 15 minutes after with the lid off. What I'm going to do is after I place, oh gosh, there's a hair on it. Um, after I place this in the uh, in my Dutch oven, before I put the lid on it, on the sides of the the paper, the parchment paper, so the place between the parchment paper and the Dutch oven, I'm just going to drop a little bit of water in, one to two ice cubes if you want. And what's going to happen is it's going to create steam. I'm going to put the lid on top of it, and that is going to help um, soften the crust because sometimes you have these really hard sourdough loaves where the bottom's super hard and it's not it's not tasty. I don't know about you, but like I love sourdough, but I don't love it to the point that I almost can't chew it. So this gives a really nice soft loaf. So here we go. too when you put this the steam in. You don't want to accidentally like burn your arms. All right and then into the oven for 30 minutes. Ta -da. All right set timer. See you back in 30 minutes and I will show you what it looks like when we take the lid off. It's gorgeous. All right it's time to pull our bread. Um, not completely out of the oven, but just take the lid off. So let me go, let me show you what it looks like. It's always, I don't know, it's always so fun, like a surprise. Like, what is this bread gonna look like today? So, put this here. Hold on one second, okay. Just a little bit. Lid off. Oh. Okay, it's not as pretty as my other one. <laughs> oh, it's kind of a bummer. All right, let's see it here. It's not as pretty as the other one. That one's much prettier, but it still looks really good and it's gonna taste really good. All right, let me set the timer here. Fifteen more minutes. Okay. I, I this one was much prettier. Don't tell the other one. <laughs> it's always you always give the pretty ones to the people that you like love as gifts, and you always end up saving the not so pretty ones for yourself. But that's okay, because it's still going to taste delicious. All right, 15 more minutes. We're almost done. Thanks for hanging in this long. Okay, we did it. We made bread. Woo, woo, woo. I am not going to pick this lid up because it will burn my hand. Whoop. All right. Let's get this bread out. Oh, lovely, lovely, lovely. One 
more loaves to bake. So I'm going to do this. I'm going to slide this little bitty over here. Like no parchment paper left, I'm going to use that. Oh, here's a tip. Always use parchment paper, not wax paper. Wax paper will basically catch on fire. So not wax paper, always parchment. Got it? All right. <laughs> Um, you have to wait at least 10 minutes before you cut into your loaf. And I know it's very, very, <laughs> wait, 10 minutes to cut into your loaf. I know it's very hard, but what's going to happen is it's still kind of cooking in there. And if you cut in it too soon, it's going to make your bread really gummy. So wait the time that you need to. I know it's hard. Look at that. It smells amazing. Maybe I will do a video next on homemade butter. It's very, very, very easy. We'll have our homemade bread and our homework butter. It's going to be, hmm, your family's going to love you. So, all right, guys, that was it. That was my tutorial on 